five, court of appeals, division one, is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number CV-20-0017. In the matter of Aceto v. Mannion. These proceedings are live streamed via YouTube and they're also being recorded. So if counsel wish to refer back to them at some point later in time, you're free to do so. A couple of housekeeping matters. First of all, you'll notice that Judge Morris is not here with us today. He is away attending to a family funeral, but he will watch the recording of these oral arguments and will participate in the decision and the final decision. Also, counsel, please remain seated at your tables as you present your cases. We have microphones at your tables, not at the podium as we usually would. So please remain at your tables. We have switched the clocks so that you can see from your seats how much time you have remaining. In terms of masks, please, if you would keep your mask on, except when you're arguing, you're free to remove it if you feel that it would facilitate your speaking. Now, each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if desired. Also, we've read the briefs and we have conferenced the case. So, counsel, with that, you may proceed. Your Honor, before I begin, I do want to let the court know I did file an amended, excuse me, a supplemental citation and then an amended supplemental citation. The amended, the only difference between the two is I referenced the wrong rule, which should be Rule 17. I also brought copies in case you would like them. All right. Well, Rule 17 does permit the filing of supplemental authority. However, we are not going to consider filings that you made today. We're not going to incorporate those into the argument. I don't believe it would be fair to opposing counsel to do so, but we'll certainly take a look after this conference. Proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is, may it please the court, my name is Lisa Montes. Present with me today is Antonio Dominguez. We represent Mr. Esqued, Ms. Valenzuela, and Drysdale Stone, LLC. We're asking this court to reverse the trial court's ruling that granted summary judgment in favor of Mr. Mannion. Although several issues are identified in our opening brief, due to the time constraints, I will focus on only three. And if time allows, then I'll address the other issues as well. The three issues are, one, whether a quiet title action can be filed by a person who does not have title to real property, but instead only has an equitable interest. Two, whether a recorded less pendants provides protection for those claiming an equitable interest in real property against a title holder who acquires title after the recording of the less pendants. And three, whether the law requires a person to pursue an unjust enrichment claim against a title holder in order to maintain constructive trust and equitable lien claims. And whether these claims affect title, thus allowing the recording of a less pendants. As to the first issue, a quiet title action can be filed by a person who claims an equitable interest. In this case, the trial court found that only plaintiffs holding title to real property can file a quiet title action. This finding, however, is contrary to the statute and case law. ARS 12-1101A states that an action to determine and quiet title to real property may be brought by anyone having or claiming an interest. The statute does not require actual title. Hold on. What interest did he have? Are you talking about my clients, Your Honor? Yes. They had an equitable interest. What happened was our clients are citizens. I know. I've read the briefs and I've reviewed the record. At best, your best argument is that he was the beneficiary of a trust that owned the property. Correct? No. What, Your Honor, the end result was to be the individual 
appellants, Ms. Brisquet and Ms. Valenzuela, were to have title. I understand that, but that doesn't answer my question. He never had title to the property. That's correct. The trust had title to the property. That's correct. And he had an interest as the beneficiary of the trust. He had an equitable interest, correct. So your best argument is that he had a beneficial interest in a trust that had title to the property. I would still disagree with that, Your Honor, in that the end result, which is what we need to look at, is that he intended, he and his wife intended to have title. Adding one more layer, he had an interest in Drysdale, which had an interest, a beneficiary interest in the trust. Correct. So there's even one additional step in between. That's correct, yes. And again, because of the way the situation was where our clients are citizens to Mexico, they were informed that because they wouldn't be at the closing, they needed to set up a trust, then set up an LLC, and then they would have the membership interest in the LLC, and that later they could then get title. This is all, they were advised that they had to do it this way from an attorney out of Texas who informed them that this is the way it had to be done, and they relied on that information. And you sued that lawyer, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And so his damage may be actually monetary, maybe monetarily against that lawyer and anyone else who may have participated. But I'm still struggling to find out what interest he had in the actual property involved. He was part, our clients were part of choosing the property. They paid the purchase price. They made it numerous and expensive remodeling. And those are all claims for monetary relief that are pending in the other action, correct? The damages, we do have a damage claim against Mr. Siegel, who is the attorney from Texas, for breach of fiduciary duty and a few other claims, personal property claims against a few of the other defendants as well. But, Your Honor, I would like to direct you to Walensky v. Miller, and that says, land is viewed as unique and an award of damage is usually considered an inadequate remedy, and that's what we're arguing here. The intent was always for our clients to eventually have title, and they relied on... Did Drysdale ever hold title? No, Drysdale never held title, and that was not... Was the intent that Drysdale hold title at some point? No, it was never the intent for the LLC to hold title. As I was stating, in this case, the court had found that only plaintiffs holding title to real property can file a quiet title action. However, this is contrary to statute and case law, and as I had mentioned, 121101A does allow for someone claiming an interest to file a quiet title action, and this is confirmed by case law. In Oliver v. Doherty, the Arizona Supreme Court stated that a party's power to recover under an equitable title seems to be settled by the statute itself, where it states that anyone having or claiming an interest thereon may bring an action, whether in or out of possession. Chandler v. Wood states that a quiet title action is one of equitable cognizance, and every interest entitled to real property, whether legal or equitable, may be determined in the action. Kennedy v. Morrow states that because quiet title is one of equitable cognizance, parties seeking to quiet title must not only show that the interest they seek to counsel is adverse to theirs, but that it would be inequitable to let it stand. The statute and case law are clear that although someone may not have actual title to real property, the claim of having an interest to a property allows them to maintain a quiet title action. The trial court's decision, in essence, rewrote the statute and eliminated the word equitable from longstanding case law. As to the second issue, a recorded less pendants provides protection for those claiming an equitable interest in real property against a title holder who acquires title after the recording of a less pendants. Here, Mr. Mannion emphasizes the value he paid for the property and claims that because the less pendants was not legally viable, he is not subject to the less pendants, and therefore it did not provide him notice. However, this argument is contrary to the law. 
Ares 12-1191B states that after a less penance is recorded, a purchaser of the property affected shall be held to have constructive notice of the penancy of the action and the claims made in that action. The purpose of the statute is twofold. One, to give notice to future third parties that whatever rights they might consider acquiring in the land could be subject to a superior right asserted by the plaintiffs in the pending action. And two, to enable the court in which the action is pending to retain the power to fully deal with such party to the exclusion of future claimants. Counsel, what effect does the trustee sale that occurred have on the list pendants? It doesn't, Your Honor. The list pendants, when the trustee sale was conducted, the list pendants was exempted out from the trustee sale guarantee. In addition to that, in the trustee sale, it was based off ARS 811 or those statutes in that area. And the statute for foreclosing on properties only applies to trustors identified on the deed of trust. And my clients were not listed as trustors on that deed of trust, and their claims do not arise from that sale. So it's independent of that sale. Well, they couldn't be. They couldn't have been identified as trustors, could they? No, they could not, because they did not sign the promissory note. They didn't sign the deed of trust. And Judge Lemire was very clear in her rulings that anyone who purchased the property from the trustee sale was going to be subject to the list pendants and whatever the outcome was of the litigation. But what effect does that statement have? I mean, that's just a statement of fact. That's the law, Your Honor. And a fact. There is a list pendants, and whoever purchases this property is going to have to deal with that, in other words. Correct. But the law states the same. And the case law— Except your argument assumes a valid list pendant. Correct. And we're claiming that— So if it's ultimately determined that it was not valid, then there's nothing there. The determination that the list pendant was not valid was contrary to the statutes of the quiet title, but also contrary to the case law when it deals with the constructive trust and equitable lien claims. And had the law and the statutes been applied correctly, the list pendants wouldn't have been found to be filed wrongfully. But going back to the statement made by Judge Lemire, the point is that it wasn't a statement finding the validity of the list pendants. That's correct. The statement applies whether the list pendants is valid or not. So, correct. Judge Lemire was not saying it was valid. She was saying it would depend on the outcome of the litigation. And that's where we were at. Okay. According to Warren v. Whitehall Income Fund 86, a list pendants prevents third party persons from acquiring an interest in the property during litigation, which would prevent the court from granting suitable relief or such as would vitiate judgment subsequently rendered in litigation. It does not matter whether value was paid. The court in Honeycutt Construction Inc. v. Stewart Title and Trust of Tucson, Trust No. 3496, specifically stated when a purchaser of land has notice of a prior claim to the land, he takes it subject to that claim and therefore is not a bona fide purchaser. And the elements of a bona fide purchaser for value are, one, a purchase made in good faith, two, for value, and three, without notice. The law is clear that a list pendants gives notice of pending litigation and it prevents third parties from acquiring an interest in the property during litigation that would prevent the court from rendering a judgment that could not be enforced. As to the third issue, the law does not require a person to pursue an unjust enrichment claim against a title holder of real property in order to maintain constructive trust and equitable lien claims. And these claims do constitute an action affecting title to real property, which allows the recording of a list pendants. ARS 12-1191A states that in action affecting title to real property, the plaintiff at the time of filing the complaint may record a notice of the pendency of the action. In addition to the quiet title action being an action affecting title, the constructive trust and equitable lien claims also affect title. In Coventry Homes, Inc. v. Scottscombe Partnership, 
which Mr. Mannion also cites, the court held that a claim to impose, that's impose an equitable lien or constructive trust on real property is an action affecting the title of real property for purposes of the less pendant statute. When Coventry was decided, there was no case on point as to this issue. Thus, the court looked at the California rulings on less pendants as our less pendant statute was taken in part from California's code. The Coventry court found that California courts have held on several occasions that a complaint which seeks to impose a constructive trust on real property is an action affecting title to or possession of real property. With that in mind, I turn to the first part of the issue, which is whether an unjust enrichment claim must be maintained against the title holder in order to pursue the constructive trust and equitable lien claims. And the answer to that is in the negative. There are several different ways a constructive trust can be imposed. Turley v. Ethington states that because imposition of a constructive trust is an equitable remedy, there is no set or unyielding formula courts used to impose it. It goes on to state that a constructive trust may be imposed whenever title has been obtained through actual fraud, misrepresentation, concealment, undue influence, duress, or through any other means which render it unconscionable. But a constructive trust could only be imposed when there was not another adequate remedy by law. If there was no other adequate remedy, you may be correct, Your Honor. It goes back to the original question. You have an adequate remedy by law because you're suing for monetary damages. No, we're not suing for – we're suing for monetary damages in certain aspects. Again, the main relief we're requesting is the property, title to the property. There is a separate monetary damage where we're asking for the court for monetary damages for personal property that was stolen from the property itself. And then, of course, the breach of fiduciary duty. But that doesn't make our client whole because, again, we go back to that the land is unique. And everything that they did for this property, they looked for it. They were the ones who made the purchase price for it. They made these expensive and numerous improvements to it. They put everything into this property intending to hold title at the end and to possess it. And they were depossessed from it, from the actions of others. So it's – when there's other means which would render it – let me just kind of go back to what I was stating. It goes on to say that a constructive trust may be imposed whenever title to the property has been obtained through actual fraud, misrepresentation, concealment, undue influence, duress, or through any other means which render it unconscionable for the holder of legal title to continue to retain and enjoy its beneficial interests. As an example of when unjust enrichment need not be proven or alleged, Turley cites to the restatement of restitution section 160, comment D, which states, if a court imposes constructive trust based on a fiduciary duty, it may be doing so in favor of a plaintiff who has not suffered a loss on the ground that the defendant would be unjustly enriched if he were permitted to retain the property, even though that enrichment is not at the expense of the plaintiff. Turley makes it clear that it doesn't matter whether a person legally holds title to real property. A constructive trust can be imposed on real property if the title to the property was obtained through fraud, misrepresentation, and concealment, as it would be unconscionable for it to do so. Turley also makes it clear that unjust enrichment need not be a claim made against the title holder in order to be successful on a constructive trust claim. Thus, in this claim, the constructive trust claim is viable against Mr. Mannion. And because Coventry is clear that a constructive trust and equitable lien claims are actions affecting title of real property for purposes of the less pendants statute, the less pendants is not legally, excuse me, the less pendants is legally viable against Mr. Mannion. In conclusion, Your Honor, I want to reserve the rest of the time, but in conclusion, the law is clear that a quiet title action can be filed by a plaintiff claiming an equitable interest. A recorded less pendants provides protection for those claiming an equitable interest in real property against the title holder who acquires title after the recording of the less pendants. And a plaintiff does not need to allege and or pursue an unjust enrichment claim against the title holder in order to maintain constructive trust and equitable lien claims. And those types of claims affect title, thus allowing the recording of the less pendants. And for these reasons and the reasons found in our opening brief and our reply brief, Your Honors, 
we ask that you reverse the trial court's decision granting summary judgment in favor of Mr. Mannion and remand this matter back to the court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Counsel? Your Honor, Nathaniel Rose on behalf of Mr. Mannion. First, I want to address 33811C because I believe counsel misspoke. And that's the portion of the trustee sale statutes that provides that if you don't get an injunction within 5 o'clock the day before the sale, that any claims that are based on the validity of the sale are barred. And it applies not only to trustors, but pursuant to the statute, it says all persons this trustee mails notice of a sale under a deed of trust. Clearly, they had notice of the sale. They filed the injunction to stop it. So 33811C would prevent any of their arguments that are based on the invalidity of easy tradings foreclosure sale. For example, the allegedly forged warranty deed after it had already been quick claim deed, or after the quick claim deed had already been recorded. So those arguments are barred by 33811C. What about their argument that the list pendants was exempted out of the trustee sale? Well, the fact that the trustee got a trustee sale guarantee and said that the validity of the sale isn't affected by this list pendants has nothing to do with the effect of the trustee sale. The trustee sale is governed by the statutes, not by whatever trustee sale guarantee the trustee acquired before doing the sale. So we aren't arguing that the foreclosure sale wiped out their list pendants. We're arguing that the list pendants was invalid and so couldn't provide any notice. And the reason why it was probably excluded from coverage in the trustee sale guarantee is because it was recorded prior to the deed of trust. So since it's a senior interest in the property to the deed of trust, when the deed of trust is foreclosed, it doesn't wipe it out. So we're not arguing that. We're arguing that it was invalid. But regardless of the dates of recording, 33811C precludes them from raising any arguments regarding the validity of the sale. For example, the easy deed of trust was somehow invalid because it wasn't signed by the owner of the property. Any of those kind of arguments are precluded by 33811C because the sale went forward regardless of the priority of the list pendants versus the deed of trust. But to the main issue here, what Coventry says is just because you make a claim for constructive trust and or equitable lien doesn't mean you automatically get to record a list pendants. The court needs to look to see if there's some basis. Look at the merits, not a full trial on the merits, but is there some basis for the claim? And here the trial court correctly said no because as your honors pointed out, title was the agreement was the trust would hold title, Siegel would be the trustee, the beneficiary of the trust would be Drysdale, Siegel would be the member of Drysdale, and eventually the squares would be the members of Drysdale. So they never were claiming any title to the property. You know, that's not an equitable interest in the property. That's the trust has the only interest in the property. Potentially the beneficiary could have some claim to the property, but they weren't even the beneficiary of the trust. The trial court didn't hold as they try to frame the argument that the list pendants was invalid because the squares never had title. The court held that the list pendants was invalid because they had no claim to title because the undisputed facts and as they alleged under oath in their complaint and first amended complaint was trust takes title, Siegel's the trustee, beneficiary is Drysdale, they eventually become members of Drysdale. Now, after they lost the injunction hearing two years into the litigation and contrary to their prior under oath verified complaint and first amended complaint, now they changed their story. And now their story is, well, we intended eventually to hold title individually. 
well that doesn't create a disputed issue of fact their intent there is no evidence in the record that siegel as trustee ever agreed to transfer a title from the trust to them individually you know they the only evidence they've submitted in the record is an e mail after the fact saying the squares were interested in getting title in their name there's no evidence of any agreement by siegel as trustee to transfer title and because of that they have no claim to title and there there's no basis as required by coventry and santa fe ridge for their constructive trust and equitable lien claims therefore their list pendants is valid and price if they weren't supposed to get title what were they supposed to get as the beneficiary they were supposed to what the agreement was the undisputed evidence in the record the agreement was they were to be the members of the beneficiary of the trust to get you're going to get the you're going to be a beneficiary but what is your what is the ultimate what's your ultimate benefit what are you supposed to receive well i yeah i don't know because there's no evidence of that in the record the only evidence in the record is the trust held title they were the beneficiaries of the trust there's no evidence in the record of well you know was the trust going to allow them to live there did they get there to live free after a certain amount of time with the trust property be dispersed to the llc there's no evidence of that in the record the only evidence is they were to be the beneficiary the a member of the beneficiary of the trust that held title so they have you know and you know the law is is clear you know being a even if the llc had title being a member of an llc doesn't give you an interest in the property it gives you an ownership interest in the entity that owns the property um and they're one of their cases in the supplemental authority they they try to dispute that but that it's a um one of those co-op situations where you have an apartment complex co-op and you know you have one share of the the corporation that holds it gives you a right to live in your your apartment and there the court said well that's really a property interest well that's not here here we have a regular llc a regular trust um you know it doesn't doesn't apply to change the fact that they had no interest equal or otherwise in the property it was the trust and the llc as a beneficiary of the trust and i i want to point this out too is the the drysdale llc didn't become a party to this lawsuit as and, the, and a plaintiff in this lawsuit until they filed the second amended complaint which was after they had changed their story um and tried to circumvent the ruling of the by the court of, in on the injunction finding that they had no claim to to title the property because they had set up this convoluted way to hold title and, and that's on the second amended complaint is october 20th 2017. so prior to that so the Liz pendants that was recorded had nothing to do with any claims that drysdale made or could have made or made in the second amended complaint and that's the only Liz pendants recorded prior to my client acquiring title um, they later record one in a uh, second Liz pendants in march on march 21st of 2018 uh, my client acquired title september 28 2017. so clearly he doesn't take notice of that Liz pendants so even if their Liz pendants prior to my client acquiring title had been uh, proper with respect to a claim by Drysdale, Drysdale wasn't the plaintiff, so it couldn't have been. And and it's clearly, as the trial court ruled, improper with respect to the claims of the Esquires. Um, so Coventry says you have to look and see if there's some basis. Uh, the trial court did that, said no basis because they set up this convoluted way to hold title and and you'll see even with their changed story uh that's in the the th second amended complaint um they don't allege they ever paid siegel anybody it was all so and so paid so and so who then paid siegel and it was allegedly for debts of so and so to us and so they had this not only a convoluted way of holding title there's also this convoluted what scheme of how the money was paid um clearly something and, and there's no evidence of the record as to why they set it up that way but you know now they have to live with the consequences of setting up you know not wanting it to look like the money came from them and not wanting it to look like they held title now they gotta suffer the consequences of that and that is that 
they individually could not assert a claim to title, therefore their list pendants was improper. And if you look, they try to, even if they had a claim for title, you can't assert a constructive trust against my client. And they try to say, well, we don't have to prove unjust enrichment to get the deed of trust. First of all, they can't get it because, as Your Honor pointed out, they have claimed adequate remedy of law. If they were supposed to get title to this property and now didn't, they have claims against the other defendants for the value of the property, or the $500,000 that they allegedly paid through this convoluted scheme. But that property was removed. Is that really an adequate remedy? Well, I think it is, Your Honor. I mean, it's a townhome in Scottsdale, and they haven't alleged, and there's no evidence in the record of something special about this townhome. I just thought the law recognized the property issue. Well, for purposes of specific performance, but that's not what they've alleged here. And so as far as there's no set element. In Arizona, there's no set elements of what you need to get a constructive trust. But clearly, you have to have some claim to the property, and the trial court found here they don't because of what we all know. It was the trust and then the LLC, and they were to be members of the LLC. But even if they had, they couldn't assert a constructive trust against my client because what the case law says is the gist of the conduct which will lead to the imposition of a constructive trust is the wrongful holding of property which unjustly enriched defendants at the expense of plaintiff. My client paid $433,000 for the property. Clearly, he's not holding it wrongfully. Clearly, he wasn't unjustly enriched to their detriment. He paid value. His seller paid value. The lien holder who foreclosed paid value. They gave the loan in chains for their lien. So there's no constructive trust against my client because my client paid value and wasn't unjustly enriched to their detriment. And that's set forth, you know, that's Harmon v. Harmon, which is cited to by Turley. There's also an additional case that's not in the briefs, Murphy Farewell Development v. Surratt, 29 Arizona 124, paragraph 23, says the same thing. Remedy is tied to unjust enrichment of the defendant. Here, my client wasn't unjustly enriched. He paid $433,000 for the townhome. So they have no evidence that Siegel ever agreed as trustee to transfer title to them individually. Therefore, there's no disputed fact precluding the courts entering summary judgment that my client took title free and clear because the Liz Penance was improper. So in conclusion, the trial court correctly held that there was no basis for their equitable lien and constructive trust claims. Therefore, their Liz Penance was not valid under the statute. Their claims, the Esquire's claims, did not affect title to property, and the Liz Penance was improper, couldn't provide notice to anybody of anything. My client took the title free and clear, and the trial court correctly quieted title in my client. And I would ask for those reasons that you affirm the ruling of the trial court. Counsel, you didn't ask for attorney's fees. We did not, Your Honor. In a quiet title action, you can only get attorney's fees if you send the demand under 12-1103 with the quick claim deed and the $5. There's case law saying in a quiet title action, that's the only means of recovering attorney's fees. And we didn't have a claim under 12-34101 because we weren't in 
we've never had any contract. Our, our quiet title claim doesn't arise from contract, and their claims against my client and the property don't arise from contract. So you don't believe you're, you were authorized fees under 33-426? Well, under, although our motion for summary judgment asked in the alternative for the, the special action under 33-420 to quiet title, if the court didn't believe it could enter summary judgment, we did not counterclaim for a violation of 33-420. So we, we did not assert a fee claim. Your honors, and I'll, I'll be brief. I only have two minutes left. For ARS 33-811C argument, if you look at subsection E, it makes it clear that the trustee's deed operates to convey absolute title and clears all liens, claims, or interests that have a priority subordinate to the deed of trust, but is still subject to all liens, claims, interests that have a priority senior to the deed of trust. And we're claiming a senior priority. And that's what he said. Yes. Also, to, Coventry says, yes, you have to have a basis. It doesn't say some basis, but you do have to have a basis. And that basis must be on the full merits of the case. And that's my understanding of Coventry. As to the initial complaint, we do allege an equitable claim. When our clients came to us initially, we didn't have much time to get the complaint filed and a less penance recorded because of the situation. We were aware that another individual had logged out our clients and we didn't know what was going to happen. And so it needed to be filed and a less penance needed to be recorded as soon as possible. As to there not being any evidence of the property being transferred to our clients eventually, Siegel does testify at his deposition, at his deposition, that the property was purchased for the benefit of our clients. And he, on his own, decided to give a deed to virtual so freight, but did not receive any value for it. And once he received notice that there was a less penance that had been recorded, he informed Carlos Contreras, who was a member of virtual so freight, that virtual so freight could not do anything with the property because there's this less penance. And yet virtual so freight still went forward in trying to obtain this loan. And the reason that Dry Steel Stone could not be made a plaintiff at the time of the filing was because the membership interest had not yet been provided to our client. Once our clients were identified as the members of the Dry Steel Stone, we then moved them to plaintiffs and removed them from being a defendant. Yeah, all the funds may have been sent from different individuals. Those were funds that belonged to our clients. There's no one, no one's making a claim that they purchased the property. Only our clients are saying they are the ones who purchased the property. The money belonged to them. And the funds were sent, I think some may have been sent to Siegel and then the rest were sent to the title company directly. And then for the restitution, restatement of restitution, section 160, comment D, again makes it clear that an unjust judgment claim is not needed against a title holder. As to Harmon versus Harmon, that again confirms that there are other ways to impose a constructive trust and there is no less penance issue in that particular case. So again, your honors, we ask that you reverse the trial court's decision and remand this case back to the trial court. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, counsel. This matters. We appreciate your preparation, both of you, and your brief. This matter is now taken under advisement. We will issue a written decision in due course and we are now at recess. Thank you. Thank you, your honors. Thank you.